Biomechanics of Fractures and Fixation. This is from the OTA Core Curriculum Resident Lecture Series Version 5. Slides are by Dr. Michael Kane, and this is Saqib Rahman narrating for you. Uh, this is our third video from the slide deck, and we've already covered basic biomechanics. We covered biomechanics of fracture fixation. So now let's talk a little bit more about fixation strategies. Um, so the mechanical environment dictates the mode of healing, but there are other factors to consider, right? Uh, there is bone quality, fracture type, comminution, location, soft tissues. We really haven't talked about that at all. Uh, and here you can see an example of uh, if you had an open fracture, let's say, where the wound looked like that. Um, this is something that you may not be able to go and go after all those um, fixation principles uh, right away that we talked about, right? So um, if we think about secondary bone healing, we're calling natural bone healing here, but secondary bone healing is achieved with casts, uh, fracture bracing or functional fracture bracing, uh, intramedullary nails, which are a form of achieving relative stability, as well as external fixation, um, and uh, flexible plates and nails. So flexible nails, you know, like for example, uh, shown here, I mean, this is an intramedullary nail, but we're calling it flexible nails. And then a flexible plate means that um, you're uh, not trying to achieve uh, compression and absolute stability, but instead you're perhaps doing, let's say, bridge plating, um, which we're not gonna t discuss in, in too much detail here, uh, which is a form of relative stability. So you wanna create enough stability um, to initiate the process, uh, but uh, if you have too little stability, you can potentially also have a non-union. So we talked about um, uh, some of these concepts already. I mean, the different ways you can potentially um, achieve primary bone healing are through compression plating, uh, and this means you try to get anatomic reduction um, you could use a locked plate when you're doing this. Um, depends on the bone quality, um, but you still would need to achieve compression to get primary bone healing. Um, and you need to get anatomic reduction. Uh, and this is often done for intraarticular fractures where we need to get anatomic reduction anyway to achieve function. So in those cases, we often will achieve primary bone healing. Now you have to ask yourself, is your construct that you have built, is it durable? It has to hold up mechanically uh, to win that race until fracture consolidation occurs. So things you have to think about are minimizing stress concentration, maximizing working length. We talked about this a little bit in one of the previous videos where we talked about lever arm and working length a little bit. So. Um, you want to minimize stress concentrations. So when possible, you want to distribute the load. Uh, if you're you know, crossing the, you know, the metaphysis, you want to have multiple and, mul and longer screws in the metaphysis. Uh, you could consider reducing your stiffness gradient by angling screws at the end of the plate. Um, you can also prevent preloading of the plate. That is, Let's say you have a plate where you're doing cortical and locking screws. Well, you always do the cortical screws first. You always do any lag fixation first also. Let's say your compression, you're you know, lagging through the plate. Uh, but we say lag before lock, meaning really cortical screws before locking screws. Because if you put the locking screws in first and the plate is not down to bone, now you put your cortical screw in, it's going to try to force the plate down to bone and create this preloading. So that's not what you want. So maximize your working length. You want to have a large distance between fixation points when possible. Uh, the number of screws is less important than the distance of where you place your screws. So for, you know, a uh, certain, you know, if you have a plate of this length and you have screw holes all along here, um, you know, is to maximize uh, length would be to put, you know, if you were to put two screws, you'd want to put them here as opposed to, you know, let's say here and here, okay? So, or if you're going to put four screws, you want to put a screw here, here, maybe in here and here as opposed to one, two, three, four, okay? So, um, 
If you're osteoporotic, you may need to consider locking screws. You may need to add additional screws. Um, you may need to, like I showed you in the example, create these near far fixation points to increase your working length. Um, I'll show you an example again of that. So, um, you know, let's say if your fracture is here and you have a six hole plate, for example, and you only have four screws. So you want to make sure you put a screw near and then far, right? So, um, and if you have a much longer plate, this may make more sense where you really don't need to add, you know, you don't need to fill all those screw holes, but you do need to maximize your working length and go near and far. Let's talk about some other uh, fixation constructs. So um, other, you know, tools we have are external fixation, plates, intramedullary nails. These are the main modes of fixation we have um, for fractures currently. So let's talk a little bit about external fixation. So um, with external fixation, there's a lot of things that will affect the biomechanics. These include pin size. And we talked about how previously the radius to the fourth power um, can increase your, stiff, uh, increase your stiffness. So it, it's just going up by a millimeter has a dramatic increase in bending stiffness. The number of pins you place with an external fixator uh, will increase your stiffness if you go up. Uniplanar versus multiplanar. So multiplanar is going to add additional stability. How much you space your pins. Um, you know, so if you have um, the pins very close. So for example, if you have a, you know, a fracture, well, this is not a good example, but uh, if you have a two fragments here and you're doing external fixator pins, if you place two pins here and two pins here, that's not nearly as stable as if you space your pins, right? So if you place a pin here and a pin here, and then a pin here and a pin here, because what, what's happening here is these two pins, they're almost acting like one pin, right? Because they're so close to each other. So this is almost like you just had one pin here, right? And you didn't have those two pins there. So when you space them out, you get maximal control of the full um, length of the bone. So try to space your pins if you want to increase stability. And sometimes you can't because of soft tissue reasons, um, let's just say. But if you want to just think about biomechanically, that's what you would do. The location of the bar is the closer the bar is to the skin, the more stable, the further away, the less stable. But we have to take the soft tissues into account as well. Uh, and a lot of times you just have to stay out of the zone of injury. You can't put that pin so close. You can't put that bar so close uh, because you have to anticipate swelling, for example. So, um, you know, when you're placing um, pins, you want to make sure you get appropriate views to see where your pins are. You don't want to be exiting, you know, all the way out into the soft tissues over here, for example. Um, so you, here you can see the pins are just engaged into the far cortex. Um, so we talked about pin size. We talked that the thickness of the pin increases by the radius to the fourth. So just doubling your pin diameter from one to two, for example, or just going up by one millimeter essentially increases 16 fold. So pin B is 16 times stronger than pin A, right? And we have these pins. A lot of times your external fixator pins are four, five, or six millimeters, for example. So it makes a big difference. Um, the more pins you have in a segment, the more stable. You need a minimum of two, um, but the more you add, the more stable. If you add pins in multiple planes, so instead of just pins all parallel to each other, you have pins in different directions, and that's achieved very easily with ring fixators as shown here. That increases your stability. And what about spacing your pins? Um, so we talked about this, uh, sketched this out for you previously. Um, if you have, uh, it's the same as working length. Um, and again, having the pins too close to each other, they're kind of acting like one pin. So space them as much as you can. So um, here's an example of, uh, you have the distal tibia fracture, shown by the yellow line in the sketch. Uh, in this case, you have the you know external fixator rod shown as red here. Uh, and um, you, know, you try to have the rod close, 
but can't be too close to the skin because you have to deal with the soft tissues as well. Uh, you have the pins somewhat spaced out, but nowhere near the fracture because you can see there's an open wound here, there's a zone of injury. We probably don't want to have a leaky draining pin right in there, and we may have to come back and plate this person. So um, with external fixators, you know, these are all the things you can do, largest pin uh, diameter that you can safely do, uh, large pin spread, uh, add pins, multiple planes, minimizing the distance of the bone to the rod. And if you think about rings, smaller rings are, you know, are closer to the skin, so are more stable. Um, adding bars or stacking the frame. Um, so these are all things that can be done uh, again, again, within reason, depending on what you're trying to achieve. But if you're trying to achieve maximal stability, these are all the things that you can do. All right, so we're going to pause here and we'll finish out um, in the next video picking up on intramedullary nails.